Today we're going to talk about parallel short merge join algorithms. Uh, just again, me here in my home office. Although I did my, I did uh, up my lighting game quite a bit, and I have the tier down here who's going to be asking questions as we go along. So let's get right into this. So before we get into the material for today, we want to talk about some logistics about what's expected for you for the, uh, going forward, starting next week. Um, so next week, we're going to be doing the uh, Project 3 status updates. So we'll do the same setup we did last time. We'll do it over Zoom, and then everybody will go for five minutes and just sort of give an update to the class of where they're at with their project. Prior to that, though, I want every group to reach out to me and schedule a time later this week to meet one-on-one -on -one to discuss the current progress of your, of your project, to see where you're having troubles, what do you need help with, and give you a sense of, get a sense of what you'll present to the class on, on next week. So those, those in-class uh, project presentations will be on Wednesday, April 8th. So in addition to doing the presentation, you're also going to need to pro provide a design document that discusses you know, in a bit more detail of what your implementation is going to look like. You're also going to need to submit the, your, what you've written so far for your project uh, submit it as a pull request to us on GitHub so that we can do the first round of code reviews. Again, I'll explain what's expected in a code review next week, but the idea is that you will be assigned another group uh, to look at their project and they'll look at your project and you'll go through and you know try to understand what, what their implementation is trying to do and then give them feedback on the quality and, and sort of ideas that they're pursuing. So again, that'll be sort of part of the participation grade for this project. Every team member is expected to uh, participate. And when we do the second round of code reviews, you'll be looking at the same uh, group's code again. So that way you're not starting over from scratch. Like you've looked at it, the code the first time, and now you're looking at it the second time as they're getting ready to submit the, the, final, uh, the final implementation to get a grade. And so you can, you'll, you'll provide them with additional feedback on, on what, what things they can do to fix them, uh, what could they can do to fix up their code, okay? So I'll post this on Piazza about reaching out and setting up meeting time. I will we'll, we'll, uh, sign up for slots on the administration spreadsheet for the class. And then we'll go in reverse order next Wednesday or next week. We'll go in the reverse order that we did in the first time uh, when, we, when we did the project proposals. So if you went first last time, you get to go last next time. Okay. So this lecture and the previous lecture have been about uh, parallel join algorithms. And so last class, again, we focused on hash joins because I said that was the most commonly used join algorithm in an OLAP system. And that's the one we're going to try to get the, get the most performance benefit by parallelizing or vectorizing it. Because again, in most OLAP systems, most of the times we'll be executing uh, uh, hash joins. The other major approach to do joins is the sort merge join. And that's what our focus will be on today. And so we'll first start off with a little background information about what a sort merge join looks like. Again, this would just be a refresher from what we discuss in the introduction class. Then we'll talk about different sorting algorithms you can use, or sort of one in particular approach we'll focus on from Intel, which would be how to vectorize and parallelize uh, the sorting uh, algorithm as much as possible. Then we'll talk about how to combine it together to do a uh, parallel sort merge join. And then we'll finish up with the evaluation that was provided, uh, that was in the assigned reading from ETH. Okay. So the uh, the sort merge join basically has two phases. It's the same thing as the as the hash join, right? You prepare the, the data in the first phase uh, in such a way that in the second phase, when you want to go try to find matches, the data is laid out or indexed in the case of the hash join. In, uh, laid out in such a way that you can easily find matches w without having to do that brute force sequential scan that you would have to do in a nested loop join. So again, in the first phase, we're just going to sort the tuples uh, on the on RNS based on the join key or the whatever if it's, or join keys if it's multiple keys, and then in the merge phase, we'll just scan through the two tables in the sorted order in with these two iterators that are sort of going in lockstep and doing comparisons between them. Um, and the idea here is because we sorted things uh, ahead of time, as the iterators are walking through, we, we would know that we don't have to ever backtrack to look for a, a matching tuple 
or go sorry goes scanning down farther than we actually need to if if we come across a tuple or a key that is different than the last key we saw then we know that you know that that, that key can't exist anywhere else so again the idea is that we are by sorting this it's just avoiding having to do a, a brute force search to find the matching key we know that it, as the iterator moves down uh, we have everything that we need so the uh, at a high level conceptually looks like this again so the in the in, so I have table r and table s first phase is i'm going to sort them by the join key i'm not going to describe what that sorting algorithm is just now but this is what we'll cover today and then now once we things are sorted we'll now do the merge phase well we'll have again these two iterators will go down uh and scan through the the tables usually once but depending on whether there's it's an equi join or what kind of join you're doing you may have to scan through multiple times we can ignore that for now. Just every single time I look at one tuple, when I'm done with it, I move on to the next tuple. And then I, just like before in the hash join, uh, if I have matching tuples on the inner and the outer table, I'll combine, them, their, combine their attributes together and write it into my output buffer. Now, the confusing thing that we're gonna hit today is that we're gonna be doing a sort merge join and the algorithm we're gonna do to do the sort will be a, a merge sort. So, I'll try to be careful when I use the term merge to make sure that I'm, I'm telling you whether it is the, the merge phase of the merge sort or the merge phase of the sort merge join. So I'll just take it out just, as we go along, I'll try to make it clear what, what kind of merge we're talking about. But at a high level, they're essentially doing the same thing. So this would have, you know, in the introduction class, we talk, discuss how to do this in a, in, you know, sort of a basic uh, high level approach. And we don't worry about workers, we don't worry about threads or numa regions. But now in, in the, a modern system, we need to be aware of these things. So we need to talk about how we actually want to speed things up by parallelizing everything. So of course, we're going to want to uh, parallelize the sorting because that's going to be the most expensive part. And again, just like we saw in when we talked about vectorization, we can parallelize the, the, this step of the algorithm, both in terms of having it execute on multiple threads at the same time. But then on each thread, try to use vectorized operations so that you know, we're operating on multiple keys or multiple elements of data uh, in parallel with a single instruction or a single set of instructions. So the, there's some basic rules that we're gonna to try to apply in our algorithm to try to get the best performance as much as possible. And again, this, this is also relevant to the hash join, but I just wanna bring this up here again. So we obviously wanna use as many CPU cores as possible that our database system is allotted to us for this execution. Some systems only execute one query at a time, so you'll get all the cores that are available on your machine as you're doing the join, and then when your query is done, it then switches over to the next query. In other systems, they'll want to try to run uh, uh, multiple queries at the same time, so you just want to be, the, the system scheduler has to be aware of how many threads they're allowed to allot to do a the sort, and make sure that it only runs on the, those cores. Obviously, also we need to be mindful of the NUMA boundaries, because again, we don't want to uh, pay this big penalty to have reads and writes go across NUMA regions, because that's be more, much more expensive than reading data that's local to our threads. So we'll see in the case of Hyper, they're actually gonna go against this second rule here, and they're gonna argue that because they're doing sequential reads when you're doing the merge phase of the, of the join, that hardware is actually gonna help hide these latencies of, of going across NUMA regions. But when we look at the results from the ETH paper, we'll see that's actually not the case. And then the last one, again, we said this before, I right, wanna be, we're trying to use SIMD instructions as much as possible so that the amount of data we're processing per instruction or per cycle is, is maximized. Right, I'm going to try to do, you know, compare this with the instructions where you know, it can only operate on one, one key at a time. So the parallel mer sort merge join is like the parallel hash join, where again, you have now three phases, because now the first phase is this partitioning step where you're going to divide the data up uh, across, to, across the workers or cores. Um, but unlike in the, uh, in the hash join case where you, you would partition both sides, in this case here, we could just partition uh, one side. And some algorithms will partition both, some algorithms will part partition one. And then for this one, again, we'll say in a second, but you can do the same kind of partition we saw last time. 
The next one will be the, uh, the sorting, sorting uh, phase. And again, this is now where we take both the inner table and the outer table and we just sort them on our join key. Then in the last phase, we do the merge where we just scan through the sort of relations and uh, compare the tuples. And if we have a match, then we write them into our output buffer. So for today, we're gonna spend most of our time on, on these two, right? There's not much more else we can say about this, but we'll see how it's gonna, what choice we can make in here will depend on what kind of merge we, we wanna do later on. So I didn't talk about uh, partitioning um, at a conceptual level uh, last class, but what I'll say here is also still relevant for hash joins. So there's this notion of, of sort of implicit and explicit partitioning when we want to do a join. So implicit partitioning would be uh, how the data is already partitioned when it got loaded into the database. And then if we know that the data was partitioned on our join key for the query we're trying to run right now, then we don't actually need to do an extra step of partitioning because the data is already partitioned on our join key and we're good to go. Um, so this would be like if I load the table and I can, I, as I load the table or create the table, I can declare in the, uh, in the DDL that I want to partition my, my table over some set of attributes or, some, or join key. Right? It might be like the, in the case of TPCC, like the warehouse ID um, or in, in, in TPCH could be like country or, or whatever the line you have in the light item table. So this is something that the, that the, the application or the database administrator has to do for us. They have to, we have to be told, the database system has to be told, here's how I want to partition things. And in our catalogs, we can keep track of what that partitioning key was, because since, since we had to write the data out through our different NUMA regions. And so now the query optimizer can say, oh, where well, I see that you're trying to do a join on the key that I've already partitioned my, my table one, so therefore I don't need to do the, an extra step to partition things because it's already partitioned. But this always, won't always work for us in a, an OLAP environment because people are one gonna, going to want to join their tables on all sorts of columns and attributes where it may not be, may not know it ahead of time and you may not actually be able to declare what the, 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 you know, the right partitioning key for a particular query because it may change from one query to the next. You don't see this so much in OLAP queries, because, or sorry, OLTP workloads because Typically, the uh, the partition key is sort of the, the partition scheme of the table follows a a sort of hierarchy. Uh, you can say, you know, here's a customer and for a given customer ID. Here's all the orders for that customer ID, and here's all the order items for that customer or that order ID. So you have this nice hierarchy where you can take sort of the slice of the data across tables and put them in a single partition. And most of the times, you're joining across those you know foreign key dependencies. In OLAP queries, like I said, people join on all sorts of crazy things, so it's hard to actually get this right, you know, to cover all possible queries. It's actually impossible. So what we're talking about instead, when we say the partition phase of a join algorithm, would be explicit partitioning, where we're going to divide the, uh, the relations based on the join key and then redistribute them across, across different cores, right? So you could use the radix partition that we talked about last class, uh, in practice, though, for the sort join, uh, for the merge sort, the sort merge join algorithm, uh, that's not going to be a good idea because typically you want to do range partitioning because you know how to divide up the data and you know what the boundaries are of that data from one partition to the next. And then therefore you know that there's no key with the same, uh, the same partition, sorry, there's no key with the same, uh, with a different value could be in a different partition that you, that you don't expect. All right, so that's again the partitioning phase. We can do radic partitioning, we can do the range partitioning. It doesn't really matter. It's the same stuff that we talked about last time. But there's nothing really different that we, we would be doing than because we're doing a, a you know, sort merge join versus a hash join. All right, so now we get into the sort phase. Again, this is, this is the, gonna be the most expensive part for us. So the key thing to understand about sorting here is in the introduction class, when we talked about uh, sorting, the, the main bottleneck, the main thing we had to deal with was writing pages in and out from disk. And so we would want to use a, an algorithm like external merge sort that was designed to do as much sequential access or sequential reads and writes to, to disk as possible. And it made sure that when it brought a, a, a page or a chunk of data from disk into memory, 
we did all the operations we, we needed to do on that, that chunk of data before we moved on to the next chunk. So we didn't have to go read to write it back multiple times. But the key thing though, is that when we brought the block of memory, uh, block of, you know, from, from disk into memory, and then maybe we, may we need to sort that, 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 that data that was in memory, we said that you know, something like quicksort was good enough for what we needed to do. Because we, you know, we weren't going to low level details, we weren't worrying about cache, cache locality and parallelization for those, those algorithms in the, in the introduction class. It was all about minimizing disk I.O. But now in this semester, when we're talking about in-memory databases, and now our database is already in memory, now we need a sorting algorithm that is aware of where the data is located and what our hardware looks like. Meaning it needs to know where, you know, if it's reading, writing to a certain memory location, is that memory location in the same NUMA region as where my thread is running? So it also means that we need to be aware of what the size of the data that we're dealing with and what our hardware looks like in terms of the cache sizes. So we may end up choosing a different algorithm uh, for chunks of data of a certain size. Right? If things can fit in, in my L1 cache, I maybe want to do one thing differently than if I'm spilling out to, to DRAM. Because again, that's an order of magnitude slower going from the cache to, to DRAM. So I want to be very clear that like what we're going to talk about today is a better way in some cases to, doing, uh, to do sorting for a join if your data looks a certain way, in particular if your data is going to fit into 64-bit uh 64-bit values or um quick sort is still very very good it can be paralyzed uh it can be implemented to avoid branch mispredictions which is one of the things we're going to try to overcome today um it, it, like i said it's almost like the pickup truck of sort algorithms it's it can almost handle everything pretty good uh and certainly you can do better and so what we'll talk about today is is a way to actually do better uh, over over uh over a quick sort. So the thing we need to understand though going forward is this notion of, of like we're essentially doing going to do divide and conquer similar to quick sort where we're going to split the data up into smaller and smaller chunks uh, called runs which is sort of a disjoint segment of the total table that has some number of elements that we're going to then now sort and then over time what will happen is uh, as we accumulate more and more of these sorted runs We'll start combining them together into larger sort of runs and then combine other you know larger sort of runs with other larger sort of runs until we get progressively larger and at some point now we have the entire table or entire key space for our join completely sorted so this is sort of the the the, the atomic unit we're dealing with with these notion of runs but these runs are going to grow in size as we get uh you know as we get further along in our execution of the sorting so the approach we're going to focus on is this cache constant sorting from Intel. So remember uh, last class, I talked about there was these six papers going, going back from 2009 discussing the, uh, so the various progressions on doing modern sorting on, on today's hardware. And the first paper was this collaboration between Intel and Oracle on doing hash joins or, or, or uh, sort merge joins with, with SIMD. So that's where this technique comes from. And so the reason why it's called cache constraints is because the algorithm is aware of how big the runs are as it's going along. And then it's going to use a different algorithm to sort those runs uh, that's going to target the fastest storage level that's available that can store the, the run in, in its entirety. So then when, when, when a run gets too big, then we move to the next level in our storage hierarchy Right, going from registers to caches to, to memory, and you know we'll have a use, have a different algorithm that's designed or optimized for uh, that 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 approach. So the uh, the at the first level, we're going to do in register sorting because again CPU registers are the fastest memory you can have, uh, but of course it's very limited in size. So we're going to deal with runs that can fit into our CPU registers, sort the entire table space into these small chunks. And then now we'll then spill into uh, in-cache sorting uh, at the next level where we're taking all the runs we generate from the first one and have it fit into, uh, and sort them into runs that fit into our CPU caches. In this case here, we're gonna target the last level cache, like L3, and therefore we need to make sure that the 
the, we're going to keep using you know this approach level two until our runs are half the size of our L3 cache. Because again, you, for this for this particular algorithm, you need to store you know the, the the input data and then an output buffer the same size that contains the sorted run. So for this one also too, as I said, we're targeting L3 cache, which is you know roughly on modern Xeons, maybe up to 40 megabytes. Um, we're not gonna be worried about trying to target L1 versus L2, L3. We'll let the harbor take care of that for us. We'll just say, as long as we don't spill into DRAM and we're still hanging out L3, then we're good to go. Once we go, we go, go beyond L3, then we'll use add a cache sorting where uh, now we're gonna sort of do a completely parallel uh, execution of, of the sorting um, where we're going to be aware of what's in cache, which is what's, what's not in cache, and we're going to have our threads actually be able to jump around and operate on different parts of the run uh, or the table space depending on you know what, what, what's, in, what's in cache or not. Again, we'll go through each of these one by one. Let me also say too that this idea of level one, level two, level three, this is not actually in the original Intel paper. I think Intel calls them phases or stages, and that obviously conflicts with the term I'm using to describe our joint algorithm phases. So I'm, I'm using this term level here. So again, let's look at, at, at a higher, high level what it looks, what happens. So here's our unsorted key space. And then in level one, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna sort these now into uh, four element runs. Then once that exceeds our CPU register sizes, then we switch into L2, where now we're gonna to combine together uh, uh, multiple sort of runs, or at least two sort of runs at a time, and then combine them into larger sort of runs until we have ones that don't fit in our CPU caches, and at which point we enter L3, where now we wanna start uh, using a different sorting approach to combine them together until we get to some point where we have our complete key space uh, in sort of order. All right, so again, high level here is we'll go, we're gonna focus on, on these two. Th the level three is a, um, it's a bit more of a architectural approach to doing sorting across multiple cores rather than an actual sorting algorithm itself. Uh, so again, like I said, we'll go through these one by one. All right, so the, 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 in the first level, again, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna combine together, or we're gonna sort together runs con containing four elements here. And we're gonna use what is called a sorting network. So a sorting network is an old idea. It goes back to the 1940s, um, like, when, like some of the first computers. But back then, when they described sorting networks, they you know, used the term wires that carry values. They literally meant like physical wires, uh, like actually, you know, in, in the copper wires in hardware. In our case, we're obviously not doing that. Everything's all transistors. Uh, so, so this is just, this is a conceptual model to describe this approach, but the high level idea is the same thing. We're just, we're just doing this in software now. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna have our input uh, sequence of four keys, and then the output buffer for each, or sorry, the, the, for each key element, there's a, there'll be this wire coming out of it that's gonna carry the value of whatever came before it uh, across until we get to an output buffer or one of these compare rate operations. So in this case here, we have 9536. So in the first step, right, we'll, again, we're all just gonna carry the value going forward. So in this first compare rater here, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, see which value is the min, which value is the max. So we'll write the min value on the top wire, and then the max value will go on the bottom wire. So in this case here, five is less than nine. So we're gonna swap, swap the uh, location. So now five will be carried on this wire, and nine is carried on, on the wire below it. Same thing down from here for three and six. Three is less than six, so this three will be carried off on this wire, and six will be carried along on this wire. So now we repeat this down, but now we're gonna do comparisons across different sets of wires. So now we're gonna do a comparison between five and three. Three is less than five, so three comes out here, five comes out here. And now in the case of this wire here, there's no other comparator we have to do, so we can write out three to our output buffer. In the case of, uh, the next comparator is nine and six. Same thing, six and nine. Nine has no other comparisons, comparisons we need to do. So we write that to the output buffer. Then we compare with uh, five and six and we produce our output here. So we were able now to, again, through the sorting network, we're able to take an arbitrarily ordered uh, set of keys and then produce a, uh, a, a sorted output buffer, right? 
So what's really interesting and cool about this is that no matter what our input sequence looks like, what, what, what keys there are what, what, and what sorting, sort of order they, they start off with, we're always going to do the same set of compar com comparisons in the same order every single time. Right? Because, again, it's a sorting network is set up to do, you know, work this way. So if you now take this sort of conceptual model and actually write up code, uh, a really simple implementation, like, like as I said, like you're going to do the exact same steps no matter what our input sequence actually is, right? So, you know, here's the first set of comparisons, right? And the second and the third, like that. So what does this mean? This means that it's super fast to do because there's no branches, there's no if clauses, uh, like you have to do in quicksort where you have conditionals to decide where the pivot point is. You just, you're just always going to execute this in the exact same order every single time, right? So you can sort of think of this as like loop unrolling, right? Instead of having, uh, you know, instead of looking at one iteration from one level to the next, I just unroll it. And here's the exact instructions I want to execute. So why does this matter? Well, now this means that we can actually vectorize this because as I said before, the vectorized instructions, uh, the simply instructions are, don't support conditional branches. And so here's a simple, here's some, you know, a sequence of code we can execute that, uh, that doesn't require conditional branches. It's going to always require to execute the same instructions in the, in the exact same order every single time, just we're just moving values around. So we can easily vectorize this. So this is how we do this. So now what's going to happen is instead of sorting one, uh, you know, one SIMD register of four keys, we're going to sort four registers comp containing four keys in parallel. And so for this one, we're going to assume that we have uh, 512 bit SIMD registers where we're going to have 128 bit lanes. So every lane is 128 bits, so we can store four keys in one 512 bit register. And so in this example here, right, I'm only showing the key, right, and that's our, that's our join key attribute, but implicitly also there's also going to be a 64 bit pointer back to the tuple that this key corresponds to. So you have to store the join key when you do this sorting in SIMD because if I now sort these keys and come up with a different order, I have no way to, to, to have the key map back to the tuple that it belongs to. So again, I'm, for illustration purposes, I'm not showing the tuple pointer here, but assume that it's actually both. And then the join key is in the higher level bits because now when I do a comparison of whether five is, is less than or equal to one, or, the, or between five or one, what's the min, what's the max, I essentially ignore this part of, of the key and I'm only looking at this other upper part here. So this is also another reason why, uh, as I said last class, the Intel paper talked about how, you know, you can implement a, a, a SIMD or vectorized sort merge join algorithm that I'm talking about here, but they couldn't do it for real at the time because you needed 512 bit registers or SIMD registers, which we actually have now since 2017. In the case of the Columbia paper, that came out in 2015, 2016. AVX 512 wasn't around at the time, so they only operated on 32-bit uh, keys and 32-bit pointers, which in a real system actually wouldn't work. But now in, in today's hardware, we, we can actually do this. All right, so now the way we're gonna do this sorting, to, we want again, we wanna come up with, we wanna produce four, four element or four key sorted runs. So our sorted runs contain four elements, and we want, but we want to sort, sort four runs simultaneously at the same time. So now the first thing we need to do is do uh, load the data into our SIMD registers. So assuming this data is contiguous in memory, we can execute that with four load instructions into the registers. But now the way we're going to sort this is that we're going to sort this in, in a columnar fashion, right? And so. What that means is I can't sort within a single register because the SIMD instructions that are available to us don't work that way. But I can sort across the registers at the same time, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort in a columnar fashion. So in this case here, nine, eight, six, seven, I'm not gonna sort that. I'm gonna sort instead this column of 21, eight, 14, and 11. So now I can just do that same min and max that we did and I showed in the, last, in the last slide, but now I'm just doing this with SIMD. So in this case here, I need to do 10 min and max instructions that are vectorized to produce output that gives me now in a columnar fashion uh, the, the sorted order. 
Again, think of each of these elements or lanes within a register as one of those wires going into my sorting network. And I just invoke the min mac construction to compare these two and these two and then these two and so forth, right? Depend the same way that I did in, in the last slide. So again, that only requires 10 min max instructions. But now the problem is, again, I, I want to produce in memory a sort of run of, of four elements. So I need to do a little magic now to get this column now in a row fashion. Because if I write out this into memory, it's not, it's not a sort of run, right? Five, four is less than, than 11, but 11 comes first. So I want to do a transpose now to take this column and convert it into a row. Okay, so there's transpose operations to do this in Cindy, and then now I end up with my, my four sorted runs, right? So now again, across, across one register, it's sorted. So it takes me now eight shuffle instructions to do that transpose, and then now four store instructions to write out the registers out, out to memory. So in, in quicksort, the, the number of instructions we'd have to execute to do this would be, be way more than what we're doing here. So this is only 26 instructions, right? Assuming the, the, the load operation only took four, four, four instructions. We take 26 instructions to end up sorting uh, 16 keys, right? Or have four four element sorted runs. Uh, and we can do this because it's deterministic. So this is actually, this is pretty phenomenal, right? This is, this is a big win to definitely do this. But now what do we have, right? Now we have a bunch of four element sorted runs across entire keys, which could be a billion keys. And now we need to start, start putting these things together. So at this point now, uh, once, we, once we sort every single key in, our, in, in the table, then we enter now level two, where we wanna start combining these together into uh, larger sorted runs. So to do this at level two, we're gonna use what's called a Bictonic merge network. And at a high level, it's gonna look like a sorting network, but now we're just gonna be able to sort uh, larger runs together into a you know, locally sort of runs into a globally sort of run that's a little bit larger. And again, we keep doing this and expanding the network, which just means more phases, more, 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 more sort of steps and shuffling and, and min max instructions until we hit the half the size of our last level cache. And because then we fall down into, um, into level three. And again, on, on a 2020 Xeon, the L3 cache size is around 36 to 40 megabytes, I think. Um, I think AMD would, would be less than that. So this technique we're gonna talk about here uh, is also from Intel. It comes, uh, came out in 2008. So it was one year before the, uh, the hash join paper from Intel came out. And I, the reason why I like this paper and I like this technique is because this is actually a, a big deal because they were able to show that by using SIMD instructions in the Botonic, uh, Botonic Merge Networks, you can get almost up to a 3.5x improvement over a SISD or a sort of uh, non-vectorized implementation. And so 3.5x is, is you know, for an algorithm that, for an old algorithm, that all you're really doing is now uh, getting a constant factor speed up because you're using hardware correctly, that's actually a big deal. I mean, you think of like quicksort, quicksort from like the 1970s. Um, there's no magic wand we can do to make that sort of fundamental core algorithm we use all the time in computer science to go faster through theory. It's just by making sure we use the hardware correctly uh, do we get the, the better improvement that, that we're looking for. So it, I'll say also too, uh, you know, th this paper was published in VLDB, one of the major database conferences. Intel is obviously not a database company, so they're not in the business of selling database, they're business of selling hardware. And so the way that Intel stays competitive, no, I do not want to restart. Thanks. <laughs> Whatever, Windows. Um, you would, like, so Intel is not in the business of selling database, they're selling hardware. And so the way they stay competitive is they add new features like SIMD instructions or the non-volatile memory stuff that we'll talk about later in the semester. They add additional things in the hardware that you as the application programmer or the database system developer can take advantage of and get actually, uh, you know, in, in sort, of, sort of justify buying new Intel hardware. And so the issue is that if, if these things are super complicated, nobody knows how to use them, then Intel's not gonna sell more chips. So they actually put out, uh, spend a, a, a good amount of time and actually do good research on putting out papers that are easy to follow and easy to read, showing you how you can apply 
uh, you know, the latest enhancements in Intel's hardware to, to databases. So the papers are always, always a good read, and I, look, and I look forward to them. So again, at a high level, the Bitonic merge network is just going to look like the sort merge, or sorry, of the, uh, the, the, the sort, sorting network. It's just now we're going to do multiple steps because we're dealing with larger sorted runs. So say this is now on our input size side, and we're going to take two four element sort of runs from level one, and we're going to combine them together into a eight, eight element output buffer. So to take two, two sort of runs, so the first one will be in the same order that was generated uh, in level one. The second one, though, we're going to put in reverse order. So in that case here, the smallest element for this sort of run is the last element. And for this one, the largest element is the last element. And the reason you just do this is just when you start doing the evaluations, uh, it, it works out the better. You know, it works the, the it's correct to do it in this in this way. So now what we're going to have it a bunch of these min and max, the same that we had before, which we can vectorize. And then now we're just doing more shuffles to do comparisons between them until we produce our our final output in, in a completely sorted run, right? And the key thing about this is that this shuffle in particular is going to keep everything in CP registers. Uh, for as long as possible without having to bring it back into uh, into the, 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 the CPU cache because right? that's going to that's going to slow, slow us down. All right, so then now once we uh, once we run out of our, uh, our cache base, we're going to then fall back into or fall down into level three. But again, this is going to use the same step, the same uh, procedures we did before. It's just now there's going to be this higher level orchestration of keeping track of what data is available in our CPU caches and having operate on that data first before we go jump to another region of memory. Uh, and so we let that get fetched into our CPU caches and before we go ahead and start executing it. And the idea here is that we're going to be doing some extra bookkeeping to keep track of where what's in memory, what's, or sorry, what's in, what's in CPU caches and where we left off in our pipeline. And although those extra instructions could potentially slow us down, the cost of doing that extra work is much less uh, it's going to do. It's going to be much less than having to have stalls in our threads while we go wait to fetch things from, from memory. All right, so we're not burning. Every thread when it runs always has stuff in its CPU caches, and it can execute very efficiently. So we're not ping ponging our thread from going going from being CPU bound to to memory bandwidth bound. Right? It just always says, all right, everything. Every time a thread runs, there's always data in CPU cache, and it's running as, as fast as possible. Right? The instructions per cycle will be much higher in that case here. So again, we're going to run this on parallel on multiple cores, keep track of what all the different cores are doing, what threads are doing, um, and within the pipeline, as data is coming uh, is coming from level two or moving along through, uh, progressing through our, our sorting network here, we can have our threads jump around and work in different parts, and just keep track of where this all is. So there's no synchronization between threads. Uh, every thread knows what it needs to operate on, uh, and we don't need to do any sort of global. There's no global coordination. Every thread can figure out on its own what it needs to do. So this is actually very difficult, uh, very convoluted and complicated. And to the best of my knowledge, no database system actually implements this um, because it makes this big assumption that all the th all the threads, all the th you know all the cores. Are only being used for uh, for sorting, meaning there's no other queries running, there's no other sort of background tasks running, uh, like networking or garbage collection or indexing or things like that. Um, and so I think the reason because if you now could have different cores doing different things that aren't involved in sorting, it's hard to have that sort of precision that you would need to recognize the data that I need is in my CPU cache or is not not in my CPU cache. I think all that becomes, you know, like I said, more complicated when there's things that are outside of the sorting process. So it conceptually, it just looks like this. So these are all the sorted runs we've produced from level two, and then we just want to start merging them. And what will happen is, as a as a thread starts executing, say in this case here, it does the merge, starts writing out data into this queue, um, and before we now start doing the next merge. Uh, we have to wait for this all this data to, to be, be done. Instead of having a thread here just sort of spin, the thread can pick up and jump to another part of this multi-way network and process the data that's there. And then when this data is finally all available in our caches, then a the thread can come back and, and pick up where, where it left off, right? So basically there's this flag at every single stage that we set to say there's 
there's nothing to do and a thread shouldn't check for, for work. And then when the thread is, uh, when it's actually available, it's sort of like a pub sub notification that tells somebody, hey, come get, uh, start processing the data that's in my queue that's available. And again, this seems like this would be bad for CPU caches because now we have our thread jumping around different parts of the program, so to speak, or the network, so to speak, and processing different things. But again, the, the penalty of having to wait for things to sit in the cache or to be available in the CPU cache before I start running on them um, is going to be much less in, in, in terms of you know, the amount of work, you're, the amount of cycles you're going to have to spend. Again, this assumes that I, I think it makes a big assumption that you have complete control over all the sockets and all the threads on each socket. And I think in a real system that that's not, not the case. Okay. So as I said, no, as, far as, I, as far as I know, nobody does this. I also think that um, the, the various in-memory database vendors that are out there, everybody's doing something slightly different. For the disk based vendors, oftentimes you'll see uh, a fancy version of quick sort if everything's in memory. Otherwise, they do external merge sort when you have to spill to disk. Um, but I briefly want to talk about what we do in our system. Um, and at some point, we should go look to see what are the other in-memory vendor, database vendors are actually doing. So we use uh, something called in-place superscalar sample support. This was a uh, paper that came out in, in 2017 by these other Germans in, in Karlsruhe. And the, the main thing I want to talk about is that uh, well, we, it's, it's, it's an open source GitHub library that, that we just link in into our system. So it's not like we're we impl re-implemented this, we're just using their implementation. But the, the basic way to think about this is that it's using sample sort, which is a generalization, a quick sort. Like quick sort only has like two, you know, has one pivot point, divides it up to two parts in each step. Uh, in sample sort, you sample some keys and make a decision about how many partitions or how many buckets you want to generate. Right? And you sort of recursively uh, do that. But the key thing about this one that uh, makes it work really well is that it's doing this all in place, meaning it's not truly in place, but it just means that the, uh, the amount of extra storage space you would need to, uh, as you start moving it around, is, is con a constant factor to the total input size. And so what will happen is as you start splitting the data up, when you, and you're writing in the partition phase and you start writing into your output buffer, when that output, bu bu output buffer gets full, rather than allocating a new output buffer, you then try to write it back into your key space over a, to overwrite a part, another part of the, the key space that's already been partitioned so that you're not waste, wasting space, or right? you're not allocating a, a more memory than, than, than you actually need. It's also uh, gonna be optimized for uh, superscalar architectures, which means that they're gonna avoid conditional branches in the same way that we talked about before. And the way to do this is by comparing keys to usually conditionally executed instructions, which the compiler can generate for us. So again, we use this in, in our implementation uh, and the, the, the research results, at least from this paper, shows that it you know, clearly outperforms um, some of the more optimized versions of, of, of QuickSort. All right, so that's the sorting phase. Again, we, we've, we've taken our, our relations and we sorted them on the join key, but now we wanna have our iterators walk through the two tables and compare, compare tuples from the outer and the inner. And if there's a match, then we make a copy and put it into our output buffer. So in our, what we'll talk about here today, we, we're not gonna assume we have to backtrack, but if you have to recognize that the, uh, if, I have, if I have multiple keys, sorry, multiple tuples of the same key, I may need to backtrack on the inner table, but we, we can ignore that for now. At a high level, all the algorithms we'll talk about here today uh, work all the same way. So just like in the sorting phase, when we wanna split this up and run this on multiple threads, we wanna do the same thing here. We wanna have multiple threads uh, scan through the outer inner table in parallel so that we can do this more quickly. And of course, that also means now we wanted to, uh, we wanna have them not require any synchronization during this, this process so that they basically can run at almost bare metal speed. So there's no sort of global coordination to decide, you know, who, who's reading what piece, piece of data, right? So um, we can do this if, we, if we're having every thread write to uh, separate output buffers. 
if you have to write to the same output buffer, then you have to do like compare and swap, to take, take, take out you know, a slot that you want to write into. And so far as I know, everyone always does, uh, does this in parallel. So what I also say too is, if you just want to do an order by in your query, so not a join, just an order by, uh, or uh, sorting for uh, an aggregation or distinct, yeah, you stop at the sort phase that we just talked about. You don't have to do this merge step. This merge step is only to do uh, the sort and merge join. So I want to talk about now uh, three different approaches to do uh, do a sort merge, right? So to do this merge phase, so put it all together. So the first two are from the ETH paper that you guys read, right? From the guys, the guys in Switzerland, and then the last one here is from the Hyper guys. It was the paper that they wrote in 2012 that said, this is the best way to do joins. This is even better than uh, hash joins. And then the, the next year they abandoned that and switched over to be entirely in, in, uh, to do hash joins. And so the paper you guys read basically shows that this approach, for as much as the, 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 the hyper Germans touted it was, it was amazing, it's going to get crushed by, uh, by, by the first one here, the multi-way uh, sort merge. So we're gonna go through each of these one by one, see what the, how they set things up and see how they're different. And then we'll do an evaluation and look at the performance numbers. What's that? All right, so the, the Terry asks whether the, the hyper Germans are the same ones as the uh, in, in place uh, super scalar merge uh, sorting algorithm. These are different Germans. The hyper Germans are in Munich. The, the, the sorting algorithm Germans are in, uh, are in Karlsruhe, different people, different Germans. Okay, so the first one is gonna be this multi-way search. And so the, the multi-way sort merge. So the idea here is that for the outer table, we're gonna have uh, all the cores sort the data in parallel um, uh, using the level one, level two approach that we talked about before. Then they're gonna redistribute the data across the cores uh, in essentially doing another round, like a range partitioning, and do the multi-way merge sort, or the multi-way merge from level three that we talked about before. We'll do the same thing now on the outer table. So that means now we have, uh, at the end of the sorting phase, we have, uh, at every core, we have a part chunk of, or we have a partition of data where we know that for any tuple in the outer table, it has to either exist or not exist in the corresponding partition from the inner table. And that tuple cannot exist in any other partition. Right, so again, it's like the greatest hash join. By breaking it up into buckets or partitions, I know that the data I'm looking for has to be in this other partition. And if it's not there, then it doesn't exist. And I, don't need, I know I don't need to check anything else. So this is actually gonna turn out to be uh, the best approach. Um, the important thing I'll say about too is that in this case here, you know, I said that the multi-way merge is complicated and no real system actually implements this. So for this paper here, this is a testbed system similar to the Columbia paper. Um, as far as I know, it only does the join. So they're not worried about interference from other threads in the system running at the same time, right? It's just doing the join. So let's see what it looks like at a high level. So say this is our adder table here. So at the very beginning, we're just gonna have that local NUMA partitioning the same way we talked about in, in hyper for morsels. Right, these are just chunks of, of data of the table that's unsorted that is local to each, each of our cores, each, each, each of our threads. So now each thread is going to take its, its local, uh, local partition and it's going to do the local sort. So that's going to be the, the level one, level two sort that, that we talked about before. Then now in the next step, we want to do the multi-way merge where we're going to combine together the values within a given range at each core and move them to be on a single core. So for this first sort of chunk here, say this first sort of range, which we know the ranges are because we've already scanned through the data once, all the data that corresponds in that same range will be then getting written to, uh, to, to this core here, which then does now the, uh, the multi-way or the level three merging that we talked about before, where we have we're sort of jumping around to different parts, parts of, the, of the, the sort of execution flow based on what's, what's in, in our CPU caches, all right? So we're gonna do the same thing now for all, the other, uh, for all the other data. This would happen in parallel. It's not like we're doing these one at a time, but every core is gonna go get all the data that they need from the other, other cores and do that multi-way uh, multi merge here. So then now what do we have? 
Now we have, for our, our outer table, we have a globally sorted, uh, globally sorted table. So now, on the, uh, on the inner table, we're gonna do the exact same thing as the outer table for the sake of space, because the screen's only so big. I'm just gonna say that there's this little sort box, but that's doing the same multi-way merge sort, or multi-way merge that we saw here. So now, what do we have? We have that every single, uh, every single core, again, we have a partition, a range partition chunk of the data, where we know that a key either exists uh, in this partition or it doesn't exist at all. Because, you know, key five should, should be mapped in here. We're not gonna find it at any other partition, partition when we try to do the join. So now we do this local merge join where we have each thread just rip through the data uh, that's local to it, having two iterators run at the same time, do our comparisons, and then every thread writes out a matching tuple to, to its own output buffer, right? So a way to think about this algorithm, what's happening here is that we're paying a penalty in the beginning to do remote writes when we do this, this, this merging across different cores, right? But that means now when we do the merge of the sort merge phase, or the merge phase of the sort merge phase, in fact, the merge phase of the sort merge join here, we don't have to do any remote reads across the NUMA regions. We're only reading data that's, that's local to us. And that's gonna be super fast. The next one from ETH is the multi-pass sort, sort merge join. So the outer table will do the same thing that we did in the last one. At level one, for level one, level two, we'll, we'll sort our data locally. But now instead of redistributing the, the data across different cores with that multi-way merge, uh, we're just gonna do a comparison across the entire table on the inner side to see whether we have a match. And that may require us to do multiple passes, hence the name multi-pass, over the, the table for every single tuple to find the data that we're looking for, right? So in this case here, the merge phase is just looking for matching pairs of chunks of the outer table and the inner table. And that maybe could be across different numeric regions. So conceptually, it looks like this. Same thing before, we have that same local NUMA partitioning. Uh, we do that same local, uh, local sorting at every partition using L1, L1 and L2 methods. Then now we'll do a global merge join where for every single thread uh, or every single chunk of data on the outer table, we gotta scan through every single chunk of data on the, on the inner table. And again, all the threads are gonna do this, doing this at parallel at the same time. So you have sort of uh, end way connections going around and everybody's reading data from everyone else, right? So we'll see now in, a few, in the next slide, the, the hyper guys are gonna claim that this is not gonna end up being a big deal because the Harvard prefetcher uh, will, will, will help us. Um, but it doesn't turn out to be the case at all. All right, the last one again is from the hyper guys. So this is massively parallel sort merge. So we're gonna range partition the outer table, redistribute it across the cores, and then now each core is gonna sort that, their, their local, local data and their partition in parallel. The inner table we're not gonna redistribute at all. We're just gonna sort it locally for whatever data that they have. Then now when we do a merge phase, uh, the scan across the different threads, uh, we still have to scan across the different threads for every single thread on the outer table, every single partition on the outer table. But since we know our data is, uh, is sorted, we know what boundary on the inner table we actually need to deal with. And we, and we don't have to scan the entire uh, partition of the inner table every single time we wanna do a lookup. Looks like this, same, same uh, cross NUMA partitioning. I'm oh, sorry, it's different than before. So now the, every thread is gonna write out uh, the data that it belongs to, uh, data within a range to a different partition. So you do a bunch of uh, remote writes in the beginning, and then now locally you're gonna sort these, all right, and these will be globally sorted. The, uh, the outer table will just, sorry, the inner table will just sort locally. And then now when I do my, my join, I have to go across partitions. So I'm gonna scan here, scan down for every single tuple in the inner table, but only scan a portion, sorry, every, scan through the entire partition on the outer table, but only scan now a portion of the partition on the inner table. But I gotta do that for every single partition to find all the data I'm looking for. And of course, again, I can do this in parallel across uh, all my threads at the same time, but everybody, everybody's gonna have to do the exact same thing, right? So what hyper, the hyper guy is gonna argue is that 
in in all of these cases, you're doing sequential reads. And so uh, we haven't really talked about hardware prefetching, but we talked about software prefetching when we talked about uh, the relaxed operator fusion, where that's where we have special instructions to tell the CPU, hey, I'm going to need this data pretty soon. Go bring it in my CPU caches. At the same time, the hardware itself is trying to figure out what your access patterns look like. And if it recognizes that you're doing sequential scans over some stride of memory or region of memory, it's going to start try to prefetch that data for you because it thinks you're going to keep scanning, uh, scanning it along. So the hyper guys argue that in, 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 in this step here, when you start doing remote reads to different NUMA regions, the hardware is going to be able to recognize that I'm doing sequential scans over these remote regions and start prefetching it over the interconnect and bringing it to your local, local uh, CPU cache in your NUMA region so that this is going to hide any penalties you, you would have from doing these remote reads. Truth is, though, this, this doesn't actually work out to be the case. And the, and the, uh, and the Swiss guys will show this in the result. One additional thing I think that came out of the hyper paper, which I think is, is interesting, is that uh, they sort of laid out some rules that you should try to follow when you, uh, if you want to implement an efficient sort merge algorithm, a join algorithm that is aware of the hardware and that, that can be paralyzable. So the first thing they're going to argue is that you don't want to have any random writes to non-local memory. Right, contrast this with the multi-pass sort merge uh, where you, you did those random writes. And so instead what you want to do is you sort of break things up and then redistribute them and have each core operate on the local data. The second rule is that you want to try to perform it. Anytime you got to read data that's not local to your thread, always do a sequential scan so that the hardware prefetcher can bring things into CPU caches and hide the penalty. Doesn't work, always work out the case for these, these joins. And then the last one was related to the, uh, the like in the multi-way merge um, in level three. It is, and in general, this is always good advice for parallel systems anyway. You don't want to have any core have to wait for another thread to do something, right? That means you want to avoid fine grain latches or synchronization barriers uh, and just have every thread be able to, to operate on, on data immediately without as, as much as possible to have an accordion with anybody else. All right, so for the, to finish up with res results, we're, we're gonna discuss the, uh, from the paper you guys are assigned to read from ETH, where they're actually gonna compare uh, the three different sort of complete joint algorithms that I've talked about just now um, on a pretty beefy machine at the time that had four sockets with a half a terabyte of, of DRAM. So again, everything's gonna fit in, in memory. Um, and so they're gonna compare against the, the three, again, the three sort merge joins uh, so the two that they developed and then the one from Hyper, and then they'll also compare against the, the Radex partition hash join that we talked about last class. So I think in this paper, they refer to it as a Radex join. It just means that it's a, it's a Radex partition hash join. So the, the first thing they want to compare against is, or evaluate, is how the SIMD sorting algorithm that we talked about uh, before from Intel, how that sort of compares against a sort of non-vectorized, a non-SIMD non implementation when you're running on a single thread. So they're going to pair against the, S S the C++ STL's standard sort, uh, which is a hybrid sort that's using quick sort in the beginning, and then they switch over to heap sort as, as you get further along. And they, this is just showing you along the x-axis, as you increase the number of tuples you want to sort, um, you can show that the, the, the throughput you can get uh, and how it varies. So this is actually a great result because this is actually corroborating the 2009 Intel paper that did the same comparison. So this is sort of like, uh, you know, further justification or evidence that the SIMD sort is preferable over to a, you know, a SISD sorting implementation. And this almost like matches exactly with the speed up that Intel reported, which was about, you know, about 3x faster. So, you know, this is good science. This is, this is really cool that they were able to do this. So then now you want to do the, you compare this one and, and the sort. So for this one, if they're going to have the outer table be 1.6 billion tuples and the inner table is 128 million tuples, and they're going to be just sorting eight, eight byte tuples. So the, uh, the way this is divided up is that we have the multi-way, the multi-pass, and the massively parallel from Hyper. And then it's broken up into the amount of time or amount of cycles that you're spending per tuple for the different phases. So the partition phase across all of them is about the same, but the big difference you now see is for the sorting and the merge. So this is the sort phase of, of the actual sorting algorithm, and then this is the merge phase 
of the merge algorithm. And then this is the merge phase of the join algorithm, right? So, you know, this is obviously very confusing because we're doing merge twice, but this is for the sorting and this is for the join. So the main takeaway here is that the multi-way actually performs the best. Partitioning is the same. The sorting is a little bit slower than the multi-pass, but then the, the merge pass is, 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 you know, there's nothing. And then the, the merge itself for the join is super fast because that's always going to be in, uh, that's operating on, on data that's local to my NUMA region. So I can, so the number of cycles I'm spending to do that, that, that comparison is super short. Where in the case of hyper, they're spending a lot more time, uh, more cycles accessing remote memory and they pay a big penalty. So this is showing you that the, the Harvard prefetcher that hyper claims is going to help them here. It doesn't. Another way you can plot this is include the throughput graph. So in this case here, when you're doing cycles per output, obviously lower cycles per tuple output, lower is better. In the case of the throughput line, higher is better because you're, you're, you're processing more data quickly. And so as expected, if you execute fewer instructions to compute the join, the throughput will be higher, right? So again, this is, this is a, a great result that's just showing you that the, you know, that breaks down at what phase of the join itself are you spending all, all your time. And if you're aware of, uh, if, you're, if you're designing your algorithm to be aware and conscious of the cache sizes and my NUMA regions, I'm able to get the better performance by minimizing the amount of, of uh, the remote reads I have to do. All right, so the behavior penalty to do remote writes in the beginning, but then the remote reads is, is you don't have any at the end. All right, so the next one I'm gonna compare is now uh, just a little more detail of scaling now the number of threads for the, uh, for, for the multi-way and the, the hyper join. So in this case here, I think this one was, uh, oh, this was all the threads on, on the machine, but this is now scaling up the, num the number of threads. So when you're down on one thread, it's not, not that, not that there's no big difference between the two of them, although the multi-way is still faster, but as you now you scale up the number of threads, you see a, the larger gap in performance. And so this is showing you now though in, in uh, log two scale, log two scale, like you're doubling the number of threads as we go along the x-axis. And so if you're able to achieve linear scalability, which is the, the gold standard, which you want in a parallel system, I mean, if I double the number of threads or double the number of cores, I double the amount of throughput or double my amount of work I'm able to, to accomplish. So in case of the multi-way merge sort, right, but at 16 threads, I'm doing 130 million tuples per second. And then if I double the number of threads to 32, I'm doing 259. So it's slightly less than 260, uh, but it's almost exactly double. And of course, once you have hyper-threading, like there aren't, they're, you know, they're not real true cores. You're, you have two program counters that you're, you're switching in between, to, in, in between on the core. Uh, and so if you're CPU bound, it doesn't really help. In this case here, we, we're probably memory bound um, so we, it's still able to get a little bit of improvement, but it's, it's not going to scale linearly. In the case of the hyper approach, right, they're not able to scale linearly at all. So going from 54 to, uh, to 90, like this should be, this should be 108, but we're only at 90. So we're, you know, even though we're adding more and more threads, we're getting worse performance. And then when we go into hyper threading, then it just all, all falls apart. Right. So the main takeaway here is that the extra instructions we're going to spend for the multi-wage sort merge in level three turns out to pay off uh, for us because we don't have to, uh, you know, we're, we're not doing remote reads when we do the, the merge phase of our join algorithm, right? And it's the overhead of reading across NUMA regions is, is what's hurt, hurting the, the hyper performance, right? In this case here, what's happening is for hyper, the reason why it's falling off and getting worse performance is because if I now split my data up across multiple threads, uh, more and more threads, then the likelihood that a th when a thread goes and tries to access a tuple, the likelihood that that thread is uh, is not that the tuple, the likelihood that the tuple my thread is trying to access is not in my NUMA region increases as I add more threads because now the data is split across multiple threads. So therefore, I'm doing more remote 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 reads. So for for this for this graph, uh, this graph is comparing the the, the multi-way merge sort, sort merge join with the Reddit hash join. Um, and what I'm showing you here is that you're varying different sizes of the inner table and the outer table. And what it shows here is that the, at, for smaller table sizes, 
the, the performance gap between the two of them is quite larger, but then as you increase the larger and you know, larger and larger tables, the, part, the partition gets more, more expensive for the hashing, and that sort of negates some of the difference you would get, performance benefit you get over the sort of merge join algorithm, but it's still, still going to beat it here, right? And so for this, the, uh, I'm combining together the, the build and probe phase uh, and just to a single number, but it shows you that the cost of building a hash table and then probing it to find a match in some cases can be less than the cost of sorting the outer table and the inner table in the sort merge join, because then I still have to go do the, the join, uh, sorry, the merge after the sorting and then do the merge to do the join. Like the cost of just doing the sorting phase and sometimes is, is greater than just to, to build a hash table. So this is sort of showing you why the, you know, using an efficient hash table implementation, parallelizing across multiple threads, even though we can't SIMD all of that, you know, all of that, that process to, in, that, in the hash join, it's still gonna be much faster than sorting. Where sort merge actually would beat the hash join is if, uh, if I my the output of my query uh, has an if my query has an order by clause that's the same that needs to sort the, the data on the same key that I'm joining on, then if I do a sort merge, I can just use the output of, of the join, which is already sorted that in the same way that I need for my order by, and I don't have to do an extra sorting. So in this case here, so say I have to do the sorting uh, for for this. I use this example. Say I have to do this, uh, an order by for this query. If the order by is the same as same as the join key I'm using my my sort merge join algorithm on, then I don't need to do anything extra after I do the join. In this case here, if I need to sort it after my hash table, then I got to add that same chunk of, of time up here. It'll be a bit less depending on the output of, of, of the join, um, but it's still an extra step I have to do. And this is something I, I need to account for in my query optimizer. So this graph is just explaining the last graph, uh, the last slide of how you vary the uh, the size of the tables when you're trying to join. What is the how does the performance gap between the two approaches uh, uh, close down? And again, this is just showing you that with Radix ha hash join, when you have larger tables, you have to do more passes to do the, the to do the partitioning, and the performance benefit you get uh, is reduced. But still, in the end, it's going to be uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, preferable over the sort merge join. And I don't forget why this was plateaus. Um, I think at some point you're just p paying the penalty of reading things uh, in and out of, of memory, the same way you would do in a, a disk-based system. Okay, so so what are the main main thoughts about this? Um, as I said, the in a modern commercial or enterprise or high-end OLAP database system that wants to be competitive, you're going to need both the hash join and the sort merge join algorithms. Right? They, they implement both, and the optimizer will figure out which one you actually want to use. And so, uh, but if you're building a new system from scratch, uh, it, unless you're targeting OLAP workloads, if you're trying to target OLAP workloads, the first join implementation you're going to want to build is the hash join because it's just the, the, the research shows that it's ideally, you know, clearly uh, preferable and faster than the sort merge join. The, and as I sort of said at the end here, we also did not consider the impact of, of having the data already sorted on the, on the join key as, as you may need by the order by clause. Um, and in that case here, like you, you, know, you, you wouldn't have to pay that extra sorting step. And that, the sort merge join actually may end up being better than the, than the hash join. But again, this is something the query optimizer can figure out for you. So that's it for today. Uh, for Wednesday's class, now we'll get into actually the part of database systems that I admittedly know the least about, um, and but it's something that I find the most fascinating. And so we'll do a we have an expanded lecture series this uh, this semester. We're going to have additional lecture on query optimizers, and the idea here is that just try to understand how we can take a SQL query and convert it into the best query plan we would want to execute on our system. So we can use all the various techniques that we've talked about so far, the join algorithms, the vectorized execution, uh, the scheduling methods, all the indexes, all these different things now we can, we can consider when we do our, uh, in, in, when we try to build our query plan. And so the paper that's assigned for Wednesday reading is just an overview of the various problems you have to deal with in uh, Query Optimizer. 
And then on next week, we'll then, we'll then talk about actual implementations. And the main difference will be this sort of dynamic programming approach from IBM versus the Cascades approach from the Volcano guy. Okay? All right, uh, that's it for now. And uh, I'll post on Piazza about getting set up for, or getting prepared for, for next week's project presentations. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Looked like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. Eight ball just dropped off. This ain't eyes hopped off and my hood won't be the same.